Hi guys, um, today I'm going to talk to you about an issue that has been going round and about uh, for many years now within the uh, group or community of uh, historical reenactors and historical reconstructors. Um, it is the issue of uh, charlatanism. So, let me begin by saying that Historical reconstruction, as we know it today, began in the 1960s and 1970s within the context of uh, experimental archaeology. Experimental archaeology is uh, recreating artifacts that are found in archaeological sites, artifacts of the past, with the purpose of studying them further and deeper. So. Historical reconstruction is a research method, a means to an end. It is progressed so as to give answers to specific questions. And those questions stem out of uh, scientific archaeological research and findings. Uh, for example, one uh, particular experiment that I had the honor of uh, being a part of and participate uh, the recreation of uh, a Macedonian sarissa, the, um, the spear, the long spear that uh, um, Hellenistic armies and Alexander's Macedonian armies uh, employed in battle, which ranged from four to seven, up to seven, arguably meters. So, uh, in recreating the sarissa, the uh, experiment included uh, reconstructing the metallic parts found at the site of the Virginia grave, reconstructing them exactly as um, precise copies of the original artifacts. And this was a means to uh, answering specific questions about the Sarissa. It was not... Um, an attempt to provide answers to completely everything about uh, the ancient Macedonian and ancient Hellenistic um, phalangite soldiers, because the answers, uh, the questions are endless. But with an experiment, the archaeologist and the researcher are trying to pinpoint, define specific questions to which questions they provide very specific answers through their research and their experiment. So, why this is important is that uh, in order to do something like that, in order to pull through uh, an academically and scientifically properly conducted project like that, one needs to be an expert. And by saying that one needs to be an expert, uh, it does not imply that someone needs to know everything. What, becoming an expert means that you follow a method, you spend time and effort to focus on a subject. <laughs> so instead of trying to um, pretend that you know everything, and instead of uh, trying to convince that you you can learn and provide answers to everything. An expert focuses on one specific aspect of history or of science, and they try to study it thoroughly with a method, with an academic consciousness, and try to be honest about their work and their presentations. Uh, what the non-expert does is that he simply does not uh, want to spend the time and the effort to become an expert or to at least try to follow uh, specific rules of what uh, a research and an academic research is supposed to be. Now, why are we? Why do we keep talking about? academic research and uh, scientific methods in historical reenactment. Because, as I said, 
in the beginning, this is something that uh, historical re reenactment as we, and reconstruction as we know it today began, came out of an academic environment in the mid 20th century. As we know today, it has come out of this academic environment and has been um, adopted by popular culture. But there is the danger, there exactly is a danger that when it is taken out of its original purpose and context, which was a research method to provide answers to research questions for academics, then there is a thin line that if one crosses that line, um, the whole uh, project can become very, um, it loses its quality, it loses its original purpose, and it borders the lines of charlatanism, as I said um, in the beginning. Uh, with particular regard to Byzantine reenactment and reconstruction, for example, and to be honest, with uh, the study of Byzantine military history and Byzantine warfare in general, this is something that uh, has come to alarm us lately. Why do we say this? We say this because uh, modern social media are providing uh, a venue for everyone to share their opinions and their knowledge, which is perfect. Everyone should be able to express themselves. But uh, caution is required. And of course, everyone is out there to be judged and anyone can judge the contact that they receive or that they choose to, uh, to receive. So with regard to Byzantine military history and Byzantine reconstruction, in this presentation I will very briefly make a reference to one of the most uh, popular, if we may say, questions, one of the most uh, famous misconceptions, perhaps, not perhaps, it's definitely a misconception, I'm just not sure about how popular it is, but anyway, so uh, it's the whole issue about uh, scale armor and lamellar armor and if it existed and how long did it exist and how can it be depicted on uh, iconography? Why does it keep being depicted on iconography for such a long period of time if it didn't exist in reality, in real life? Well, yes, it did, and it is possible, but we will not go into detail uh, in this question today because we will have to talk about uh, the nature of Byzantine hagiography, uh, the religious orthodox art, and this will take us much more time than I can spare today. But very, very precisely and very specifically for the issue of uh, scale armor and lamellar armor, we, we, we have to say what we know. We have to state the facts. So the facts are that uh, scale armor in itself uh, exists in, uh, it, it was invented since the um, time of ancient Egypt, since the time of uh, the ancient Mesopotamian civilizations. Um, so it was definitely in place by the first millennium of uh, BC. And it was definitely very popular among the uh, Persians, or generally speaking, the, um, the empire that the Persians had uh, created in the 6th century up to the up to 5th and 4th century BC. And it became very popular in the Greco-Roman world, basically because of the, uh, because of an armor that was developed in in the uh, Imperial Roman uh, era. It was an armor called Lorica Squamata, which had the uh, characteristic tiny scales. But this armor, this is the funny part, this is the interesting part. This armor appeared in, Roman, in the Roman army during 
basically the second century AD, and then and then it stops completely. There is no more archaeological evidence for it after third or fourth century AD. So by the time we're into properly Byzantine period, uh, the use of this scale armor has already uh, ceased. It doesn't exist anymore in real life. It does exist in art and in um, sculptures all around the empire. And maybe this is the reason why it was uh, popular for so long to be depicted in art. But then many people say uh, perhaps uh, the depiction of this armor in art implies that there was some kind of a ceremonial or posh perhaps uh, armor that people like to use in parades or in ceremonies which was different from uh, the equipment that they actually used in real battles. Well, this is exactly the kind of questions and conjectures that being a non-expert leads you to make. This is exactly the kind of charlatanism that I'm talking about. Because an expert would never compose a question like that. Why? Because an expert would first look at the sources. If you want to know, uh, if you want to make a conjecture, if you want to ask about a possible um, reality, the only uh, solution that you can provide an answer to those uh, questions is through the sources. You go to archaeological site evidence, you go to written texts that describe artifacts of the past. And in those texts, in those uh, archaeological, in that archaeological evidence that survives, there is no um, no reason to believe. There is no reference. There is no mention. There is no proof at all whatsoever about the existence of ceremonial armor in Byzantine times. Many people like to refer to, uh, you know, um, uh, the Peri Vasilias Taxios, the, the ceremonies of Emperor Constantine, which describes the court of the Byzantine Emperor and the palace. And, and it, the, it's like people try to find something where it doesn't exist. And they see, for example, references to uh, uh, elaborate and expensive um, attires and clothes that were made and worn only and exclusively on parades and ceremonies. And they say, oh, well, if they had clothes specific for ceremonies and parades, why did they not have armor for the same reason? Well, you cannot, you simply cannot make conjectures like that. It's it's not, there is no way to prove. And when something cannot be proven in science, uh, you just stop there. If you cannot produce or find the answers, the, the means to answer this question, uh, the question falls apart from the beginning. Anyone who has gone through uh, universities, anyone who has tried to make a dissertation or a master thesis knows how this works. Um, and this is why non-experts uh, who are um, you, who deal with the reconstruction and historical reenactment uh, are always uh, trying to step into waters that they do not know how to swim. Um, it's something that we always have the good intention to help people to understand and to. Uh, um, Correct, but if that intention falls upon dead ears or a dead wall, then um, this is something that people can no longer um, this is something that has to be addressed and put out there for people to know so. 
ceremonial armor in Byzantium? No, we have no evidence. Scale ceremonial armor in Byzantium? Many hundred reasons more to say no. No, 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 no. There is no archaeological evidence, there is no textual evidence, uh, especially for the time of the 15th century. People go as far as trying to imagine scale ceremonial armor in, at the time of 1453, which is a <laughs> wild imagination, to say the least. Um, so, no. <laughs> None of this uh, stands, and there is no reason for people to waste time and effort and mental energy to uh, dealing with these questions. Just move on. Study the real thing. It's so magical. Re recreating what existed definitely sometime in the past makes you feel so inexplicably magical. It, there is nothing to compare with that. Uh, imagining, uh, imagining things that never existed, but we wish they would. Uh, this is what, uh, you know, nationalism does to people, perhaps. Sometimes, you know, it's not only nationalism, but all the ide idealized images of the past. People want to project the past in a fun fantasy that makes them feel okay with themselves in the present, but that has nothing to do with history. It's simply fairy tales. So, historical reconstruction doesn't go with fairy tales. If you want history for fairy tales, it's up to you, but it doesn't, there is no space for that. No space at all in historical reconstruction. Thank you very much. Have a nice time, everyone.